Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this uh, webinar, Bonfire of the Data Protection Vanities. We've just called it that uh, because it is a bonfire night, um, and I don't know how many of you are actually going to get to go to a bonfire um, this evening. Very few, I should imagine, unless you've got lovely um, space in your own back garden. Uh, but what this really is, is a data protection update uh, aimed at uh, higher education institutions, uh, thinking about some of the key issues that are around at the moment. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, uh, our uh, agenda is, uh, first of all, we're going to be looking at the test, trace and isolate. I think we've got a slide there that shows um, uh, for the agenda for, for the session. Uh, an update on the latest guidance now. I put that in there, I have to say, when we first advertised the session, uh, and I will be hopefully talking about the latest um, issues. You will bear with me, I hope, because things have been moving at such speed with uh, test and trace that uh, it is difficult to keep up with the guidance. Uh, but uh, and, if, and if you think I am talking out of date, then please do drop me uh, a line in the chat box whilst we're, we're talking. and, and um, uh, and I'm uh, very interested to hear if anyone's got any um, updates uh, on, on what's happening with the latest guidance. Uh, I wrote an article for University Business Magazine, which was published this month um, on Test, Trace and Isolate. I was having a look at it again this morning. I think it's still valid, but obviously that was written nearly a month ago in order to meet the publication dates for, for November. Um, but uh, I'd be interested in any feedback on that article as well. Uh, and the things that I'm going to be talking about today will, will be very much chime with, with what I said in that article. So looking at test, trace, isolate, and sharing data with Public Health England and NHS Protect. Then um, we will be looking at recording of lectures. My colleague, Rosie Lucas, is going to talk about that. Uh, another big data protection issue uh, is the end of Privacy Shield and um, any organisation that's relying on Privacy Shield so some advice about what to do next uh, and then we will have time for Q&A at the end. So first of all to think about the um, test trace and isolate uh, and what what does that mean? What does that mean for, for universities coming back? Uh, most of you will have been back uh, had students back on campus for some time now. Um, some of you are in the um, uh, enviable position of being able to carry out your own testing, where you've got, um, the, especially with the, 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 the hospital um, lab facil testing facilities. And I know that a number of universities have uh, started with, the, certainly with their own tra tra tracing systems, um, but also with their, in some cases with their own testing systems. So to move on to the next slide, we'll see what uh, what we need to be thinking about if you're going to introduce your own um, test, test, test track and trace um, or test trace and isolate. If you're in Scotland, then that's test trace, isolate, protect. In Wales and Northern Ireland, I think it's test trace and supports. So we all call these, as, as, as you can see, there are different, four different regimes, um, different terminology, but we really are talking about the same thing. So testing people to see if they have got the virus, tracking the spread of the virus, and tracing contacts um, where, where, where an infected person has come in contact with someone else. Now the very first thing to be thinking about uh, with regards to introducing any sort of system where you're going to be collecting um, personal data, especially in this case, when we're talking about special categories of personal data, is a data protection impact assessment. And you can see um, we've got a slide here that uh, tells us what the things we're thinking about. So it's absolutely, you know, categorically, the, the, the ICO uh, has been very clear that they consider um, testing for the coronavirus and contract tracing to be uh, sufficiently high risk 
to meet the current requirements for carrying out a data protection impact assessment. And um, so what does that so what does that mean? It's it's like any other risk assessment, it's how the university um, balances the the the, uh, the need for the new uh, the proposed system um, with the rights of uh, and privacy of the individuals concerned. Um, there are all sorts of the, 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 there are all sorts of templates out there. Uh, the ICO has uh, a template data protection impact assessment form. If you're not familiar with these, I personally find the ICO form a little bit clunky. But if you use that form, you can be confident that you're asking all the questions that you need to be asking. Um, we have. Um, templates that we prepared for use with our, our university clients. So um, if you want to come and have a chat with us about that, we can, you know, we work with a number of universities uh, that are doing this, um, uh, doing a test and trace. Um, the other document that you need to be thinking about is your record of processing activities and updating that to make sure that it is covered for testing, uh, for test and trace. And the uh, and probably most importantly is the privacy notice uh, and any consent forms that you're going to use with students. And that is where we have come uh, into some difficulties with some of the universities that we've worked with so far that started early on, started without doing a data protection impact assessment in some cases, and went straight in with reliance on consent. From the individual to processing their personal data. Uh, it seems obvious that you absolutely want um, consent and you certainly don't want to introduce a compulsory system. Um, any system I think needs to be uh, voluntary unless you can show that you are legally obliged to carry out to, to, to do this. Um, if you rely on consent as your lawful basis for processing personal data. It must be um, informed, specific, that's fine. You can give plenty of details of what they're consenting to. Freely given, and if you're talking about your staff, that's not likely to be possible because of the imbalance between uh, employer and employee. So you can't give freely given consent in an cons employment context, but also for the students, freely given, means that it can be withdrawn and once you've started a process where you're recording data and you're sharing it with third parties you do not want to be held to ransom by one or two individuals or or a group if there's some sort of um you know mass protest uh, withdrawing consent and that you, then you have to go back and start deleting their data from the system and contacting third parties and telling them that you no longer have consent. So the, the appropriate lawful basis is uh, that, that it is necessary uh, in, the, in the public interest uh, at the moment for, for, for testing um, and, and tracing and, and tracking the, the uh, pro process of the, the, the disease. There's, there's, it's not a legal obligation you're not required to introduce your own test and trace system. But I think anybody looking at the national system would uh, be legitimate to say, I think we're going to introduce our own local system. Uh, if the national system was up and running and running really well you know, with great take up, then you probably wouldn't need to introduce your own system and, and the, the necessity test wouldn't be met. But in this case, I think you a uh, very strong uh, case for, for arguing that, uh, that this is necessary for, um, for public health reasons. And then you need to be telling people what you are doing. So I would suggest that you have a specific privacy notice for COVID testing and uh, if, if you're doing the testing and for contact tracing if you're doing uh, that as well. And you need to be telling individuals that uh, it is entirely voluntary for them to provide a sample, but if they do, 
you will be uh, recording that information internally and you will be sharing the results with NHS Track and Trace um, and Public Health England in the event of a positive test. And then you need to be thinking, are you going to share the results with anybody else or any third parties uh, within the university that you need to share those results with? But be transparent, be upfront, and be straight with the individuals to make sure that they know what you're doing with data. Um, so, yes, yeah, so in, in, in summary, um, I would say that uh, this, this will come out when you do your data protection impact assessment. Uh, but first of all, you only need only collect what you need. Um, so in terms of tracing, you need the name, contact details, date and time, of, um, you know, wh wh where the person's been. Um, for, for testing, you would need the date uh, and time of that the test was taken. Only use the information for the purpose it was collected. And I think this is where the, the government uh, trace um, app, tracing app, went wrong because at the outset they were, they were very keen that they would be getting a lot of really useful information that they could use for, I, I don't think they were nefarious purposes, but they would use for other purposes. And people were, I think, probably quite rightly worried about the amount of information. Certainly things like location data that was being collected. So literally, you, if you collect location data, absolutely fine, because you want to know who's been in contact with each other. That is part of um, the uh, you know, a, a good track and trace system, but only use it for the purpose of um, working out if there has been a contact. Do not use it for working out if uh, somebody was um, not at work when they should have been or, 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 or in the wrong place. Um, don't keep the data longer than necessary. At the moment, I think uh, the guidance is still 21 days. I'm not aware of that having changed. Uh, so but please do correct me if, 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 you, if you know that. So uh, after 21 days, a, a robust system to securely delete uh, the data. Unless, of course, there has been a positive test or uh, a, a positive contact, in which case then that is recorded. And that data uh, is, is shared onwards. Um, do make sure that you have appropriate technical uh, measures in place so that, you know, it needs to be a secure app that individuals can have conf confidence in, but also your organisational measures. Make sure that all the people within the university that are a part of the programme or your, your, what responsibility for keeping the data safe. And most importantly, as I said before, be transparent uh, about your privacy or uh, do, do a, a one-off special notice specifically for um, track and trace. So I say I was going to give you an update on the, the, the latest guidance, but I think there has, I'm not aware of there having been a change since, um, since uh, the, the, the issues that I've just said, just, just said now. I'm so very happy, very happy to be corrected on that. Um, take your questions at the end, but do feel free to put those to um, uh, Imogen now whilst, whilst we're working. I'm just getting a note that there's a lot of echo. I do apologise. I, I don't know if that's me. Um, but do put questions to, to Imogen. Uh, and anyway, to get away from that echo, I'm going to hand over now to Rosie Lucas, who's going to talk about our second subject, which is um, recording of lectures. Thanks, Penny. Um, so throughout the pandemic, universities have had to look at different ways of teaching students as lockdown restrictions are imposed and remote learning becomes the new norm. So I'm going to talk through some of the legal issues that universities need to consider when recording lectures and, and provide some tips on what you can be doing when impl implementing new online learning tools such as recorded lectures. Um, we'll be covering data protection and what the issues are and what universities can be doing, such as carrying out data privacy impact assessments, updating your privacy notices and thinking about security measures, and also um, intellectual property, what the issues are in relation to copyright and performance rights, and what universities can be doing, such as reviewing their IT policies and um, employment contracts. So moving on to the next slide, please, Imogen. 
Thank you. So um, the ICO has issued clear guidance that data protection isn't a barrier to increased and different work types of remote working. So um, in data protection terms, universities can record lectures as long as you can demonstrate that you're complying with the law. Um, when recording lectures, universities are processing personal data of the staff who are delivering the lectures, and in some cases, students who are, attend and participate in those lectures. Um, universities can record lectures where students are attending in person, um, for example, if they ask a question and their voice is being captured in the recording, or if they're sat in a position where they're caught on camera. And others also provide sort of interactive classrooms where lectures are recorded and students can engage with the recordings by commenting and asking questions. Um, personal data will need to be processed in line with data protection principles and you'll need to ensure that they are processing personal information fairly, lawfully and transparently. So um, looking at fairness, um, you'll need to consider whether processing staff or student personal data in this way is fair. You'll need to take into account what staff and in some cases students would reasonably expect in relation to the use of their personal information in this way and the reasons that information is being used for this purpose and also any potential detriment to the individuals involved. Um, when considering whether processing is fair, you'll also need to take into account um, what staff or students are being told about what the university is doing with their data and why. This overlaps with the requirement to be transparent, which I'll come on to um, shortly. Then um, looking at lawfulness, you'll need to identify and document a lawful basis for processing personal data um, when recording lectures. For most universities, when you're recording lectures for educational purposes, you'll be able to rely on legitimate interests or public tasks as a lawful basis. <coughs> um, although it's not strictly a legal requirement, it is best practice when re relying on legitimate interests as your lawful basis to carry out a legitimate interest assessment. This is a sort of light touch risk assessment where you can identify the purpose and decide if it counts as legitimate interest. Consider whether the processing um, is actually necessary for the legitimate interest that has been identified and consider the interests and fundamental rights of the individuals whose data you're processing and whether those interests and rights override the legitimate interest that you've identified. So um, you don't need to rely on consent, uh, as Penny's touched on GDPR consent is hard to comply with and it needs to be able to be withdrawn as easily as it is given. Um, it's probably not an appropriate basis if you're recording students and probably not available to you if you're recording staff. Then um, looking at transparency, um, transparency is all about being open and clear with people about how and why you're using their personal data. So you'll need to tell staff and students what you're doing with their personal data how the lecture recordings will be reused, how long they'll be kept for, and um, who their personal information will be shared with in those recordings. Um, you can do this by updating your privacy policies for staff and students, or by creating a specific privacy policy for lecture recordings. And this should be provided to staff and students in advance of the recordings taking place. Um, and if you're still recording uh, lectures where students are able to attend in person, it might also be appropriate to provide them with an opt out um, such as by providing them with a specific area of a lecture theatre where they'll not be caught on the recording. So then um, moving on to what universities can be doing. So um, firstly, consider carrying out a privacy impact assessment, a data privacy impact assessment. So when using new technology and using personal information in a new way that poses a high risk, universities should um, carry out a data privacy impact assessment to identify the advantages, risks, and ways to mitigate those risks and other ways of working. Um, carrying out an assessment like this will um, show that you've considered the risks and um, it can also be used as the part of the university's accountability record. Secondly, um, as I've already mentioned, update or create a new privacy notice for lecture recordings. Um, this, should be, this should cover what you'll be doing with staff and student personal data when recording lectures, um, how long their information will be kept for, how it will be reused, and if it will be shared with any third parties. Um, and as I've said, they should be signposted to the privacy policy before the recording begins so that they're aware of what you'll be doing with their personal information. And thirdly, um, consider any security issues um, when using online platforms to record lectures. Um, some of the issues that you might want to consider include whether the platform has end-to-end -end encryption, and if there are sufficient security measures in place to prevent unauthorised access, 
um, and other issues such as whether the platform has GDPR compliant processing terms and whether there are any transfers of data outside the EEA and if there are appropriate mechanisms in place for those transfers to be lawful. Then um, moving on to have a look at intellectual property. Um, so um, there are a number of intellectual property issues that you'll need to consider. We'll have a look at copyright and performers rights. Um, copyright is an issue that universities will need to consider where um, teaching materials are captured in a lecture recording, um, where an, an employee creates a work in the course of their employment, the default position is that the copyright will belong to the employer. Um, this means that where a lecturer creates teaching materials within the course of their employment and there's no agreement to the contrary, um, the university will own the copyright and permission will not be required to include those materials in the recording of the lecture. So um, check your university's IP policy and contract of employment to see if the position differs from the default. Um, and if it is different, you may need to look at getting an assignment or permission to use the materials in the recordings. And this would apply for both existing um, recordings and those that you um, create in the future. Um, the position would probably be different um, for visiting lecturers, and it's likely that either the visiting lecturer or their employer would own the copyright in their teaching materials. And so you'd need to um, consider checking that you have the appropriate license to record and reuse those materials. Then um, performers' rights are different from copyright in that they don't automatically belong to the employer and their rights are afforded to performers in relation to their performances. And it's likely that performers' rights would arise in the case of recorded lectures, as a lecture was likely to be considered a performance under the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Um, performers have rights in their performances in any recording, film or broadcast of that performance. And a recording means a film or sound recording made directly from the performance broadcast or um, from another recording of it. So um, similarly with um, copyright, we recommend that you check your um, university's IP policy and employment contract to see if there's any assignment of performers rights from the lecturer to the university. And um, if there's not, you can, you can consider whether you can get consent from the lecturers to record their lectures uh, or whether an assignment of those rights in relation to existing and future recordings is possible. So um, then moving on just to recap quickly what we've covered. Um, Lecture recordings are obviously one of the ways that universities have been enhancing the learning experience of students throughout the pandemic. Um, and we've had a quick look at some of the data protection issues and um, IP issues that you'll need to consider when recording lectures. Um, so if you're introducing lecture recordings at your university, consider carrying out a data privacy impact assessment and update your privacy notices for staff and students so they know what you're doing with their information and um, review your IP policy and employment contract in relation to copyright and performance rights. Um, so that's everything I'm going to cover and I'll um, hand you back over to Penny. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so the third topic uh, that we're going to look at today is the end of Privacy Shield. So just a little bit of background as to what Privacy Shield is, for those of you who may not be aware. Uh, Privacy Shield replaced uh, a, a mechanism called Safe Harbour, which was uh, put in place to permit sharing of personal data from EEA countries with the US, specifically the United States. Um, it, the Privacy Shield is only relevant to the United States. The, the rules arise because um, under GDPR, uh, you may only transfer uh, personal data to another territory where there is adequate protection for personal data and, and adequate rights for the data subjects in that territory. There are a number of countries, for example, um, Japan, New Zealand, or I think um, Canada, that have um, what are called adequacy assessments. So, so the EU has itself um, done an assessment of, of the regime and has satisfied itself that there is sufficient uh, protection in place. But with the US, uh, it, it was felt that, the, generally speaking, uh, they, their, their data protection laws did not meet the adequacy requirements of the EU. And first of all, Safe Harbour, and then subsequently Privacy Shield uh, was put in place to protect personal data. Now, following a challenge, 
uh, by uh, uh, an Irish um, data subject, Max Schrems, his name is out there, I'm afraid. Uh, he, he, he was challenging Facebook Island's ability to share data with Facebook US, in particular following the Snowden leaks um, and information about the US national security and the ability of the US to um, intercept communications, private communications. Uh, in challenging Privacy Shield, uh, Mr. Schrems also, well, actually, Mr. Schrems was, was challenging the, the, the standard basis of sharing uh, personal data outside the EEA, which are, uh, I've used the cause term model contract clauses on the slides, but uh, the, the correct term is the standard um, contract clauses. These are EU mandated contractual provisions that permit the sharing of personal data uh, from uh, an EU exporter to a non-EU importer and that they were they were being challenged the ecj fortunately found that the standard contractual clauses were valid but they struck down the privacy shield they said the privacy shield did not provide sufficient uh, protection um uh they they looked at the rule of law in the states they looked at nationals they looked at access for the security agencies to communication. They said that there was not an effective and enforceable uh, system for individual rights, and there was no effective administration and judicial remedy available to EU data subjects uh, if there was um, an issue uh, with the data breach in the States. So Privacy Shield is no longer valid. This decision was given in July, and immediately after the decision, that meant that if you are relying on Privacy Shield, it is to transfer personal data, you need to come up with an alternative means. Um, otherwise, the transfers are immediately unlawful. The decision did not put any transition period in place and, uh, and did not give any uh, definitive guidance as to what to do instead. So the first thing I would say to all of you, uh, if you haven't done so already, um, is to go back to check um, your record of processing activities, which should identify if you are sharing personal data internationally, and it should identify if Privacy Shield is the basis on which you are um, doing so. Absolutely, as a priority, you need to come up with an alternative basis. I'm going to look at what those might be. The one to point out that lots of people forget, don't notice, is Google Analytics. Lots of websites, uh, lots of EU companies rely on Google Analytics. Google Analytics relies on Privacy Shield for the most part. There, there are various different Google entities, and um, I have seen some organizations that have contracts with Google uh, that have incorporated standard contract clauses, but most ordinary users. Um, or most ordinary website owners uh, will be relying on, on the Privacy Shield, and that is no longer permitted. So if you are collecting personal data via your website and using Google Analytics, I strongly recommend that you look immediately at what alternative measures you can put in place to stop that transfer of data um, outside, uh, outside your website, or to contact Google and say what alternative do they propose? The alternative to Privacy Shield is what I mentioned earlier, the standard contract clauses. Now, these have been in use for many years. They were in use long before GDPR, and uh, you know, they're, they're very familiar to, to most international organisations. Uh, they set out uh, a mandatory uh, criteria on the data exporter, um, and the mandatory criteria on the data importer, and we just uh, slot them on the back of our contracts as schedules and say any personal data will be transferred in accordance with, with the standard contract clauses and uh, sign and put it away in the drawer. And for most people, um, I mean, as long as they were actually complying and not in breach of the, the contract clauses, it was far, it was enough. However, 
what Schrems ha decision has done has created an extra accountability burden on any organization that is relying on standard contract clauses. And they have said it is not enough to simply rely on standard contract clauses. You must also carry out an assessment of adequacy, your own assessment of adequacy as to the uh, level of now how small data controllers in the EU are supposed to assess the adequacy of uh, uh, an international jurisdiction if the EU itself has not managed to do so is a bit beyond me. And as I said, there is no definitive guidance on how to overcome this. And to verify that this do apply. Hello, sorry. Can I just interrupt you? Your connection just dropped out for the last sort of 30 seconds or so. Do you mind just repeating the last oh, kind of little of bit that you've yes, done? Yes, I'm so sorry. Right. It's okay. It's only done it once or twice, but it was just that little bit that we missed. So if you right. wouldn't mind just repeating that, please. Thank you. Uh, so um, so if, if you're a data controller within the EU or a data processor that's using a sub-processor outside the EU, then you must assess the level of protection afforded to data subjects in the country of the importer. And uh, as I said, you know, how individuals are going to do this uh, if, when the EU hasn't necessarily managed to do this, uh, you know, is, 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 there's no guidance on what that assessment looks like. Uh, the contract clauses do allow, uh, do require the data importer to provide um, information to the data exporter as to the protection that's in their country. So if you've got a reasonably um, strong contract position, you can say to your um, data processor in India, China, Russia, so it's, it's not just the US that's caught here, to, you can get them to tell you what protection is in place. You have to make that decision as to whether or not it is um, effective and that is going to be really really tough for most for most organizations so the first thing that i would suggest that you do let's say is check your record of processing activities and identify what contracts you have with um third party country with with with, with um either controllers or processors in third party countries and what basis you are relying on um, if it's if it's privacy shield or if it is um, standard contract clauses and think about how you are going to assess the adequacy um, of the protection in that country now as I say it this is a this is a really huge task but doing nothing is, is just not an option uh, but if you can show that you're somehow on the journey to putting this right, you know, if you can get the, st the standard contract clauses in place, even with US um, entities, then, then that is being on the journey. But at, at some point, we're hoping that the ICO will provide some uh, more detailed guidance as what would be deemed adequate. But I'm really struggling if the, if the European court has said that the US does not have adequate protection in place to allow privacy shield, then how can an individual small organization uh, judge that the US has sufficient protection in place um, for their purposes? And I say, and it's not just the US. You know, who is carrying out the assessment on China, on India, on Russia? If the test is that the national security agencies have are able to, to intercept um, and access communications, then you know this this can drive the coach and horses through all our international transfers. I'm sorry that I don't have an answer, although obviously I will deal with uh, try and answer any questions that you might have. I don't have a definitive answer. 
And that takes me on to the final slide, the final point, which is the term that we keep going back to Brexit um, and deal or no deal, because post Brexit, um, the UK will itself be a third country for the purpose of EU data controllers who uh, wish to transfer personal data to the UK. Hopefully, the best scenario is that the UK would get a decision of adequacy and, uh, and that we would be deemed a country that's, that, that, that no further action needs to be taken. That is highly unlikely within the time frame at the moment. What is more likely, but still not certain, is that we would be deemed adequate as part of a deal, Brexit deal. However, adequacy is almost certainly going to require the ECJ to determine the you know, any ultimate disputes. And we, as we know from all our Brexit negotiations, the uh, UK government is unhappy with that. Which then takes us to the, um, the other option, is that uh, the UK will be up there with the US, with India, with Russia. We do know there's some very very, the, the most jaundiced viewpoint is that um, the EU will not accept that the UK security regime provides adequate protection um, with, uh, with, 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 I can't remember the, the, the act, it's called the, the Snoopers Charter, it was Dripper, uh, and the Five Eyes. In it, the EU may say that actually they do not believe that the UK has sufficient protection to allow EU countries to share data with us. Where that will leave us, I'm afraid, I do not know and I do not have the answer. Uh, but with Brexit, as with um, just all international transfers, we just go look at the last slide. Um, there are some things that you need to be doing to prepare. You need to be looking at your contracts with uh, any clients in, in the EU to make sure that they are um, up to date. Uh, you might want to look at the definition of uh, GDPR and make sure that you're referring to the UK GDPR because we will have our own um, GDPR in force uh, post Brexit. We already do by virtue of Data Protection Act 2018 uh, and there's no suggestion that that's going to change. You need to make sure that your privacy notices um, differentiate when you talk about sharing information outside the EEA we talk about sharing information outside the UK or the EEA. Uh, and similarly, your record processing activities needs to be updated to make sure you're covering off your international transfers. Uh, so on that rather down note, um, I'm going to pass back to Imogen to see if we have any questions. Um, I'm going to just pull the slides down so you can um, see us properly for a moment. Um, so we have had some questions anyway, we've had a few in the Q&A and a few in the chat. So I'll start with the Q&A ones and then we'll go across and look at the ones in the chat box. Um, so starting from the top, um, the first question we have is, um, regarding performers' right, could we rely on implied consent given that the academic has been told in advance they're being recorded and what the recording is going to be put to? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's what for Rosie, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Penny. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I think I'd have to look into that one a bit more, but then I can get back to you on that, um, unless, Penny, you have... Uh, yeah, sorry to put you on the spot there, Rosie. Yeah. I think, so, so implied consent, so are we talking about, uh, it would depend on whether or not you're talking about a member of staff or a visiting lecturer. If it's a member of staff, then obviously you'll be looking at the contract of employment. And as Rosie said, the default position is that, um, oh, so this is for performers rights. So, so the default position for copyright is that you would own it if they're an employee. Um, and, uh, and hopefully your contracts for employment would deal with the performers rights point. Um, implied consent is a very tricky thing. So visiting lecturers, I would get explicit, um, explicit consent. I'm, I'm not sure that you could uh, assume that you've got consent because the law deems that they have um, the, the, the rights accrued to the individual performers' rights. So I, I, I would be minded to, to say get um, explicit consent. But as Rosie says, we can we can double check that point. 
great thank you we've just had another question come in which i think sort of goes off the back of this so i'm just going to jump onto that one so again regarding performers right um could this mean that academics could eff effectively hold the university to ransom if they don't give consent any practical advice as how to overcome this um, yes, I mean, it, you, you, and the, the, the way to deal with it is, is in your um, contracts of employment to make sure that the, those rights are assigned. Uh, if it's a contract for services, uh, then, it, then it needs to be um, both copyright and performance rights need to be assigned and moral rights waived. And if it's a visiting lecturer, you may need to make sure what the terms are and that they understand that the lecture is going to be recorded. And I do advise a few universities who don't record, so, so, so they give the visiting lectures the, the option, so you can be recorded, uh, if uh, and, and you, uh, but you agree to assign the rights to us, or we won't record. Great, thank you. Um, there is one more question which which might sort of roll off the back of that one, so I'm going to just hop to that one as well. So, um, just a short one. So, do education exemptions apply to recordings? I don't know whether Rosen is that. I, I would have to say um, we come, I have to come back to you on that um, because I'm not um, I'm not an IP expert. That's okay. We can um, we can come back in um, and get back to people on questions anyway. So um, we'll hold that one. Um, so just moving on to the next one. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how to say this. If it's J I S D or JISC stated that performance rights were an area where the university might take a risk as to whether to ask for consent or not. Is this right? Um, you may, they, they may well indeed take a risk. I mean, the, the, chance, the chances are no one's going to say anything. Somebody's coming along, they're providing a lecture, um, they are, you know, they're, they're, they're nobody being recorded and they know it's going on the website. Um, you know, funnily enough, VWV didn't ask me to waive my moral rights before I did this webinar, but I'm assuming it's in my contract of employment. Um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's relatively low risk, but the upshot may be that you would have, if, if somebody did challenge and um, say that you didn't have the right, then you might have to take the webinar down. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, the, the lecture, you might have to take down the lecture, and then you need to think about which lectures are key to your... Um, to, to, to the programme, uh, you know, if, if, if it's just something that's sort of nice to have, uh, an add-on, then you, know, you might want to take the risk. If it's absolutely fundamental part of your um, uh, course delivery, then I think you want to get those express rights. Great, thanks Penny. Um, I'm just going to jump across to the chat and just cover those ones as well. So um, this one's for you, Penny. I think it's probably specific to what you're talking about when it came in, but um, hopefully it'll make sense. Um, so it says, in practice, what would Google Analytics propose as an alternative? Do you have any experience of whether they are open to using SDCs? Um, yes, I do. So I've, I've, I've had two clients recently who are um, using uh, uh, SDCs with, with Google, uh, but uh, they already had a specific contract with Google uh, um, and, and, and dealing dealing with the, um, the service that's being provided and, the, uh, and, the, and, and they're paying for that service. Uh, in terms of small websites that um, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen Google coming forward and offering anything, um, and it's you know, probably hugely disproportionate to engage solicitors um, to, to you know, negotiate with Google on your behalf. But, um, and I, agree, so I really don't have an answer for all those small websites that, that they're using um, Google, but just don't have the resources to negotiate. Uh, but yes, Google are open to uh, standard contract clauses. Thanks, Penny. Um, so moving on to the next question then. Um, is the overseas transfer risk assessment expected to have both a jurisdiction level element and a processor level element? Um, yes, uh, so you, the, the, the pros that, and this, let me just be very clear, this, this is not, this is not new. It was always, um, part of the law when you are appointing a data processor that you have to do some due diligence on that 
that you're expected to do some due diligence on that processor. If, you know, if, if they were not, if they didn't have appropriate security in place themselves, then you should not have been appointing them as your data processor. The, so there's a jurisdictional element um, that has been, that's been really ramped up by the, the, the Schrems decision, but absolutely, the, 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 the due diligence that you should be carrying out on, on any processor that you're using, um, and that's in the UK as well as overseas, um, that, you know, that, that, that still applies. Great answer. Thanks, Penny. Um, we've got one more so far. If anyone has any more questions, we do have some more time, so do pop them in the Q&A box. Um, but the final one we have at the moment, um, what are the implications if we want to share personal data with Students' Union to help check that the students affected with COVID-19 are fine? Would we need to rely on consent as the lawful basis may not be a public task or legitimate interest? Um, so would, I would want to know, I would want to probably want to know a little bit more about why you wanted to share the data with the, the student union. Um, so obviously, yes, you need to look at your public tasks. You now, is it, is it within the, um, uh, the, 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 your, the, the governance, the, the public tasks of the university? Um, but if the reason for sharing the data is to track the virus, then usually it would be, um, you would be all right to, to rely on the... Uh, public health um, grounds. So I'm just just getting my GDPR out to remind me what the other one, the, the other um, options are that are open to you. But for the for everyone that I've managed to advise so far, we have got third party sharing within the um, the the Article Nine condition that it's uh, necessary for public health. So a lot of it would just depend on what what are your reasons for sharing. Um, because it's only going to be with it if you're sharing the health data with the student union, uh, but obviously a positive test would be health data. Um, and if they if if they are um, assisting you with your track and trace, perhaps you could look at appointing them as a data processor, and then they can rely on your lawful basis for sharing. Um, so for, for for processing, as opposed to sharing the data with them as a controller in their own right, for which you would need the um, the additional level. I don't know if that helps. I don't know if that answers the the, the, the question. But uh, the first thing is why is it necessary to share with the UN student union? And if you can get over that hurdle, it's usually obvious what the what the necessity grounds and therefore what the lawful basis would be. Thanks, Penny. I've just noticed someone's just um, popped a note in as well saying that. They found out yesterday that some data was accessible to the students' union so that they could do well-being checks for those in isolation. Right. So, um, so that, so obviously that, so that, that, that is that is sharing. That would be. Are you sharing health data though? So, so obviously, if 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 you're just sharing the names of students that are isolating to enable the student union to provide um, support and. Uh, support to the individuals that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sharing um health data um so you would be able to rely on the um that this is processing within your um the, pub the public interests because obviously if you're a public authority you can't um necessarily rely on the legitimate interests student union can rely on legitimate interests uh, but the university would not but uh, if you're able to to show that it's task carried out in the public interest i.e for the purposes of the university um and so you need to be looking at what your um what's your public interest you know, have you have you have you done a public interest um assessment in the same way as other organizations do legitimate interest assessments to see uh, i'd be surprised if um, support for students didn't come in, with, didn't come within that. But happy, happy to talk about it. If you think there's something a bit quirky happening in, in, in a particular area, I'm very happy to talk about this off offline. Thanks, Benny. Um, we've had a couple more questions come in, so we'll move on to those ones. Um, so the next one is regarding standard contractual clauses for US transfers. Um, does the panel have a view on the supplementary measures as referred to by the ECJ that may need to be put in place alongside the FBCs? 
any practical thoughts would be useful. So I'm assuming by, by the, the, the supplementary measures that you're talking about, the, the assessment of lack of quality. Um, and as I say, I, 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 I'm really struggling how an, an, uh, an organisation um, is going to get over that assessment uh, if the EU, um, if the ECJ itself thinks that the US has, um, it, it, it is not a, a, an adequate jurisdiction. There are contractual measures that you can take. You can ask the data importer to, um, to warrant that they do not fall within, I'm just trying to know what the US law is, it's FISA, the, um, the reach of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, so you can ask them to warrant, and that doesn't, it doesn't apply to all organizations, to say, no, we're not subject to that act. Um, you can ask them to say that they would not voluntarily provide information to the US government uh, without checking with you first. And you can put, um, and, and I would put um, termination provisions in the contract to say if they come under that act, that you have to, that you have a right to terminate and they will turn all data to you. That is you know, a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut, it feels, but um, I, I'm not sure how else you could honestly say, we think it's, that there's adequate protection of our data in the US. Thanks, Penny. A um, couple more coming in. So we've got about five minutes left, so we will and we'll try and get through them both. Um, so the next question we have is, when would you recommend starting to put standard contractual clauses in place with other countries in the EEA? Should we be doing this now in preparation? Uh, yes, uh, so obviously they need to be in place by the end of the transition period, um, and it can take time. So I would say uh, start now. Start uh, look at look at look at your um, your contracts to see who is engaged. And there's, don't forget, this is the transfer of data from the EEA into the UK. So the UK is still able to send personal data to uh, a, an EU country. Because as far as the UK government is concerned, the EEA system is adequate, has adequate protection, uh, and, uh, unless the Brexit deal says something different. It's the other way around. Um, that set, set, so it's if you've got information coming in from another jurisdiction, I would, I would start looking at that now. Having experience of negotiating with um, other jurisdictions, it can take a while. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a few more coming. We've got some really long ones coming in, so uh, um, bear with me whilst I read them out to you. One on copyright for Rosie, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Next question we have. Um, what are your views on Art9 legal condition for processing health data as part of an internal track and trace programme? Given that there is not a legal requirement to have such a programme and processing not being undertaken under the responsibility of a health yeah, so uh, for, for COVID, for track and trace, um, I don't, it's, it, it, it's not the, 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 the processing for the, um, for, 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 for the health purposes, but yeah, as you say, you, you need a, a health professional. Now for track and trace, I will be looking at the um, public health exemption under um, Article 9. Um, but I was just actually thinking, whilst we were talking there, just thinking back to what the question about sharing with the student union. Um, and whilst, uh, whilst I haven't seen it tested, I wonder if there is any grounds to, so that the processing will be necessary to protect the vital interests of the individuals in that case, if it's about providing, you know, mental health support. Possibly, possibly. I, I haven't, I've just, just come up with that now. I, I haven't looked into that. <laughs> uh, but public, public health uh, for Article 9, rather than... Um, uh, health uh, provision of healthcare. Uh, thank you. Any more to add on that one, Penny, or should I move on to the next question? I think the next one will have to be <laughs> our last one. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Um, again, it's a little bit long, so just bear with me. Um, are we really being asked to conclude whether a jurisdiction has adequate protection 
or are we being asked to form a risk-based view considering the types of personal data that are being transferred? For example, we might feel comfortable transferring names and email addresses to a Ugandan conference provider, but we might not want to transfer um, certain special category data, for example, health and sexuality. Uh, absolutely. And so on, so on the face of it, you are being asked to make an assessment. But in the real world, and my experience with the information of Commission and Office is that they take they generally take quite a pragmatic view when um, to, to, to questions like this. So certainly uh, it will depend on the nature of the data um, and you know, the, 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 the adequacy, the protection that needs to be in place, as you say, to protect uh, special category data is not necessarily the same as um, business contact names. The, the ruling doesn't specifically differentiate, but I think the ICA words but what is important is that you can show that you are giving this some thought and that's the other thing in my experience of um you know, people that are being uh that are being investigated by the ico what they want to see is that you have taken it seriously if you've done something wrong that you've learned your lessons uh, that you're putting steps in place to make sure that you do have compliant measures you know, and if there's any guidance there that you meet the, the basic minimum in the guidance but for the most part the ICO is not in the business of finding well-meaning businesses who are trying to do the right thing. Great, great Q&A, thanks Penny and Rosie. Um, that's, that is all we have time for, there were a couple of questions that we haven't got to but they are particularly long ones so um, I suggest that we'll have a look at those offline and come back you separately if that's if that's all right with you penny <laughs> oh thank you yes that's some working for me brilliant um well thank you again penny and rosie for a great session and thank you of course to everyone for joining us um this is the final uh, webinar in our series of webinars that we've been doing for universities so this is the seventh um the rest of them you can catch up with on our website if you want to and um, otherwise as i mentioned at the start we'll, we'll be actually i didn't mention at the start i think penny did um, we'll be uh, in touch in the next few days with the recording and slides, so do look out for those if you want to watch anything back. Um, otherwise, that's it from us today.